The second part of the NIBOSH risk assessment project involves completing the actual risk assessment table of which there are six columns. So I'm going to be going through each of those columns explaining some common errors and pitfalls that you might want to try and avoid. With column one, this is where you put in uh, the hazard and the hazard category. For this one, all you need to do is put those two things in there. You don't need any additional information. So you just need the hazard category and the hazard. Now for the hazard category, what you need to do is choose from the list of hazards that are covered in each of the elements of unit two. So for example, you wouldn't put physical and psychological hazards down as a hazard category that's an element heading what you do is actually choose one of the hazard categories that are covered within that element so for example you could put noise as a hazard category or vibration as a hazard category or radiation as a hazard category then it's a case of identifying a hazard within that hazard category you don't need to be overcomplicated with this part, just simply describe the hazard so that the examiner can build up a picture of, of what you've got going on. So no industry specific jargon or abbreviations. The example that NIBOSH give in their guidance to the unit two is they give vibration as a hazard category and then for the hazard they give sanding and grinding activities. Now that might be okay for a bare minimum pass standard but I would hope that anyone studying with Stockwell safety would, a, would be able to give a little bit of a better standard of a description of a hazard than simply put in sanding and grinding activities. So I would suggest being a little bit more helpful in terms of your description of the hazard. So to improve on the example that Nibosh give. The hazard category is fine, i.e. vibration, because that's taken directly from the syllabus. But as far as the description of the hazard goes, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to actually describe what sanding and grinding activities are taking place. For example, using a handheld orbital sander to prepare bodywork panels prior to respraying. The second column is who might be harmed and how. And for the first part of that, it should be fairly straightforward. You're not listing individuals by name. You're listing categories of people that could be harmed by that particular hazard, such as people working in the workshop area or uh, delivery drivers dropping off deliveries to the warehouse. For the how part, what you need to do is describe the harm in a very simple and practical way. So is it a physical injury like a cut or is it more of a, a health hazard that would cause an illness or a disease or infection such as asbestos giving rise to lung cancer, for example. Then describe the circumstances, the workplace circumstances that would give rise to that harm occurring. The example that Nibosh give is the excessive use of faulty handheld tools that go on to cause hand-arm vibration uh, disorders such as vibration white finger. So in that example, the harm is described i.e. the vibration white finger and the circumstances giving rise to that harm is also described in the excessive use of faulty handheld equipment. Columns three and four, they work together in the new format of the qualification. In the old format, what Nibosh used to ask for is for the learner to identify and list at least 20 uncontrolled hazards during a workplace inspection and that was problematic for uh, a number of reasons but one of the main ones was that people sometimes struggled to actually identify 
20 hazards that were being uncontrolled, especially if they were working in for a, for a business that happened to be very good at managing health and safety. With the new format, that has been taken into account. So what you're able to do with the new format is include hazards that are, uh, that are being very well controlled. And it's quite simple. What you do is if you identify a hazard that is being particularly well controlled, then just list all of the control measures that you've got in place in column three. And then if there are any additional controls that you identify that you could put in place to reduce the risk even further, then you put those in column four. On the other hand, if you identify a hazard that is not being particularly well controlled, you might not have anything or very little in column three but it follows on logically that if you haven't got very much in column three then you will have some suggestions of what you can do to to control the risk in column four so with this there are no hard and fast rules about how many you need how many controls you need in column three and how many controls you need in column four. But what is very important is that you don't leave any of the columns, and this goes across the entire table, don't leave any columns with nothing in there. So for example, going back to what I previously have just mentioned, if you don't have any controls to list then just put not applicable in the column rather than just leaving it blank now, this is very important because Nibosh have referred learners for leaving empty boxes empty columns even when everything else about the risk assessment has been fine so literally the only thing wrong with it is that there is an empty box all the learner would have needed to do to get the pass is to put something along the lines of not applicable because all control measures uh, no further control measures uh, have been identified uh, or whatever something along those lines even if it's just to put not applicable would be fine rather than leave that column blank so it's very important that you make sure that you pay attention to that particular point. Column five is about timescales relating to the controls that you've put in column four. So with this, what you need to make sure is that your timescales are realistic. So for example, if one of your control measures is to unblock a fire exit, and in the timescale column, you've put a timescale of one month or three months or whatever against unblocking a fire exit, you're very unlikely to gain any marks for that because it's, it should be done immediately or within, within a day. Similarly, if one of your control measures, for example, is to uh, implement from scratch a health surveillance program across the entire business, maybe involving the use of external third party contractors to undertake the health surveillance tests and report back. It's not realistic that that's going to get completed inside of a week. It would be more realistic then to put a, a three month time scale or a six month time scale on something like that. So just make sure that your time scales are, are sensible and realistic. Related to that point is that when you've got all of your time scales in column five, make sure when you're reviewing them that you've got a good mix of both shorter term time scales and longer term time scales. Because what this will do is it helps to demonstrate your grasp of the concept that there are different levels of causal factors for health and safety issues and unsafe acts and unsafe conditions. So some causal factors will be more immediate. And with those immediate 
causes, or sometimes they're referred to as direct causes, it tends to be the case that the control measures required to rectify those immediate causes are often quicker to implement than control measures that address more underlying or root causes. Oftentimes, those sort of underlying and root causes, fixing those might mean changes to policy and procedure and processes and therefore they are going to usually take a longer period of time to be able to implement those underlying and root causes. So I wouldn't want you running the risk of it coming across to the examiner that you don't understand that there are these different levels of causes. There's direct causes, there's underlying causes and root causes. But if all of your timescales, all of your control measures have got timescales of a week attached to them, it may come across like that. So just make sure that you've got a, a mixture of shorter term timescales and longer term timescales and that they are realistic to the control measures that you've got them associated with. And then with column six, I think the only thing I've got to say about column six is just to keep it simple and practical, i.e. for the control measure that you're talking about, this is who is actually going to do it, who's going to be responsible for doing it. Don't start going down any rabbit hole of who's, who's the duty holder with ultimate accountability under this health and safety legislation or that health and safety legislation. It's don't don't take that route with it. Just simply put down who's going to be responsible for implementing that particular control measure. And again, a job title is fine. You don't have to actually name specific people. So keep it nice and simple and practical. That goes for the entire risk assessment table. Don't start talking about moral arguments and legal arguments and financial arguments in part two, which is the risk assessment table, because that there is another section of the risk assessment project that deals with moral arguments, legal arguments, financial arguments, and justifying you know, your health and safety uh, control measures, your choice of different control measures. So don't put any of that in the actual table. Just keep the table very, very practical and simple and straightforward and make sure I'll em I'll emphasize again just just so it um, hits home don't forget that you must not leave an empty box on your table or an, em an empty column on your table even if there's nothing in it put not applicable and um, you shouldn't have any problems with part two I hope you've got some value out of the video that you've just seen. If so, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to the channel so that you can be alerted to when we produce and upload more videos.